I doubt that there's a person in this room tonight who hasn't read and been really touched by a Frank Bruni column. Of course, for some of us, that may have been one of his restaurant reviews. However, for most of us, Frank Bruni, who is the first openly gay op-ed columnist for the New York Times, let me repeat that, he is the first openly gay columnist for the New York Times, which is sort of remarkable in a couple of different ways, but we'll leave it at that. We read his words in a way that they almost seem to be our own. He speaks for us, and he does so with a grace and personal vulnerability that I believe has a really palpable impact on anyone and everyone who reads his work. LGBT or otherwise. Frank was named op-ed columnist in June of 2011. He joined the paper in 1995. Throughout his years at the Times, he's worn a variety of hats, including chief restaurant critic for five years, and previously as Rome bureau chief. I'm sure there are some stories there. In his free time, he has also written two New York Times bestsellers, a memoir, entitled Born Round, as well as Ambling into History, a chronicle of George W. Bush's presidential campaign. He also co-authored A Gospel of Shame, Children, Sex Abuse, and the Catholic Church. A Pulitzer Prize finalist for his work at the Detroit Free Press prior to coming to the Times, and later a winner of the George Polk Award, Frank is a consistent contributor to the Sunday Times the Time Sunday Magazine, where he has profiled an array of well-known entertainers and political figures. My favorite contribution of his, perhaps, was during 2010 through 2011 when he wrote a column on bars and drinking called The Tipsy Diaries, but I digress. A native of White Plains, New York, Frank is a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. We're so pleased to have him with us this evening to facilitate what I'm sure will be an insightful conversation with members of three wonderful families. So please join me in welcoming New York Times op-ed columnist, Frank Bruni. Frank. Thanks. I got my Marco Rubio water. Um, uh, whoever chose the, um, the theme for th tonight's event, Allies, I think, has an unbelievably great grasp of the last year of news and the way the story, the, 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 the fight for equal rights story has been going, and especially even the last couple of weeks, which means the person who chose this theme was prescient. You know, as we've watched in Washington, one federal lawmaker, lawmaker after another basically kind of rushed to say, me too, me too, me too, um, on the marriage equality front. Um, I think one of the main stories over the last couple of years of the movement for equal rights has been uh, the joining of it. We've not only been joined by people who aren't necessarily LGBT themselves, but I think they, uh, they're in the foreground of the fight right now, and I think it's making all the difference. So tonight you're going to meet um, some really lovely, amazing families uh, that kind of speak to this sort of dynamic. And I was asked first to talk a little bit about one of, one of my allies. And I don't know if the picture's on the screen. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, my earliest and best ally was my mother, uh, Leslie Fryer Bruni. Um, she's there with my dad in 1995, about a year before she died. Um, and the reason she is looking so gaunt is because she'd been fighting cancer for many years by that point. She was a much more vigorous person in 1982 when I was 17 and when we had the first discussion about my being gay. Um, she came to me one day and she said, uh, in her sort of um, anticipatorily hurt and bossy way. If you were gay, you wouldn't tell me, would you? Um, uh, and I caved, and I said, yes, I am. Uh, and this was 1982, and her response at the time wasn't exactly the politically correct one. She said, well, I want you to go see a therapist just to be sure. I said, okay, that's reasonable. And I went and I talked to, I don't know how she picked out the gentleman she picked out. I went and I talked to him for an hour. He asked me a lot of questions. I came home and she said, how did it go? And I said, well, not only am I sure now, he's sure too. <laughs> and in 
And she said, okay, and she shrugged her shoulders, and then in her inimitably, inimitably bossy way, she decided to take control of my gayness. And the first thing she did, I was a swimmer back then, and a lot of swimmers, our hair gets bleached by the chlorine, so sometimes we decide we'll help it along with some horrible product like Sun In. Um, and I was especially, being a budding gay boy, I was especially bad at this, and so I would sometimes come home with just really badly blonde hair. And so she'd had enough of that, so she took me to her hairdresser to get proper highlights. <laughs> then she came to visit me freshman year of college, and we were eating alone, and the waiter was both extremely handsome and extremely flirty. And so when she was paying the bill, she pushed the uh, credit card slip over to me. She said, here, you sign your name so you can put your phone number just in case. But her biggest concern was that I not tell any of my siblings prematurely and that I not, not tell my father prematurely and that she give me a signal when she thought the mood was right and the coast was clear and everybody was gonna be okay. So uh, my first year of college was a series of phone calls from my mother that went like this. Phone call number one, don't worry, I told your brother Mark myself. <laughs> phone call number two, don't worry, I told your brother Harry. Phone call number three, don't worry, I told your sister Adele. And phone call number four, a little later, the big one, don't worry, I told your father. So mom was like my personal India. I outsourced coming out to her. <laughs> or rather, she volunteered for it. Um, my father and I eventually would come to talk quite a bit about this, and I wrote a column about it not long ago. Um, in the last years of my mother's life, we swapped promises. She made me promise that um, if anyone were trying to take extraordinary measures to keep her alive, or if she were suffering any extraordinary pain, um, that I would step in and make sure it didn't happen and make sure she had a quick and as quick and painless a death as possible. Um, and I promised that, and she promised me uh, that when she was gone, uh, my father would be as wonderful to me and as loving of me as she's, she'd always been. And I don't know how she pulled that off or what their conversations were like, but it's exactly what happened. Um, and I, I owe that all to her. Um, neither of my parents were politically involved in this issue, um, and you're going to meet people um, who have been politically involved, but I wanted to tell the story of my mother because I think when we talk about allies, we're not just talking about people who have given money, we're not just talking about people who voted for a politician who's especially friendly to our concerns. I think we're talking, even before all of that and fundamentally, about people who loved us enough, unconditionally enough, and respected us enough that we could stand up um, and engage the fights we have and get to the happy, exciting frontier where we are right now. I now want you to meet some other families and I'm gonna introduce them one by one briefly. They'll come out on stage and then you'll hear a lot more about who they are as we, as we kind of chat among ourselves. Um, the first people we have are Paul Singer and Andrew Morris Singer. Could you guys come out? Um, Paul is the, uh, pre is the president and founder of Elliott Management, a trading firm in New York, and he is an enormous donor to many Republican causes and to uh, many gay rights causes. Andrew is a physician who uh, is, uh, is the president and one of the founders of Primary Care Progress, which is trying to reform uh, the delivery of primary care and the training of primary care physicians, and he also teaches, if I'm correct, at Harvard Medical School, yes? Thanks for coming. Our next two people are uh, Brian Burke and his son, Patrick Burke. <laughs> Brian is the former general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team and of the 2010 US Olympic hockey team. And he's on the advisory board of the You Can Play project. If you don't know what you can play is, I'm sure they'll tell us more about that uh, tonight. Uh, Patrick is the president and one of the founders of the You Can Play project, and he's in law school right now, yes? Um, and lastly but not leastly, we have Marianne and Aya Simpson. Could you two come out? Uh, Marianne is a, a leader in socially responsible investing and is first vice president of the Royal Bank of Canada in North America. Aya is, was recently ordained just three weeks ago, so congratulate her, as a Unitarian Universalist minister. Did I get that right? Good job. <laughs> all right, so we're, gonna, we're just all going to chat a little bit right now. We can start on the far side, Paul and Andrew. 
Can you tell us a little bit, I don't even know how long ago it was exactly, tell us a little bit about how you, Paul, came to learn that Andrew was gay, and was that a shock and a challenge, or was it something that um, was easier to accept? We were in um, France uh, attending World Cup, which was a soccer World Cup, which was a uh, family tradition. It was 1998, and uh, with my other son, Gordon. And uh, we had this discussion at dinner, and Andrew was asking these pointed questions about uh, uh, gay politics and uh, issues related to gay politics. And it, was, it sounded peculiar to me, because we hadn't had that kind of conversation. And uh, Gordon went off to Monaco to gamble, and uh, um, uh, I asked Andrew to meet me uh, back at the hotel, and I was very concerned and didn't know what to do. Uh, um, and I, he agreed to meet me, and I went to his room and sat down and said, um, are you gay? And you know, if you do something like that, sometimes you get a, <laughs> an honest answer. And, uh, uh, and I, my recollection is that he said basically something like yes. <laughs> and so the answer to your question is I was shocked, but I was, I was very uh, prepared in the sense that I knew that uh, if the answer was yes, um, it, that my response was so important to our relationship and that I better be calm, collected, and think it through um, uh, rather than reactive, and that's what I did. Andrew, what was your experience of his response and what does it mean to be basically gay? <laughs> uh, I think what, what, what uh, just to fill in a, a few details, I think when he asked me, are you gay, I think what I actually did was I said, well, uh, you know, um, why do you ask? <laughs> Which, uh, you know, if you're not gay, you probably wouldn't say that. Um, but, you know, for, for me it was, it was kind of the, an unsurprising surprise, his reaction. Because, you know, that was, that was 98, it was in the wake of the Matthew Shepard murders. I had a number of friends who'd come out to their parents and had really bad reactions. And so this was just sitting in my mind, and you know, I was really building up to try and figure out how do I come out to my dad? How do I, you know, he's a conservative person, what, what do I say, what do I do? And I just had this terrible sense that he wouldn't react positively. So when he did react incredibly positively, it was an amazing surprise, but in that moment I, I realized it was not a surprise because it was completely consistent with our relationship. I mean, we've been always incredibly close, we've done a ton of stuff together, I mean, you're, you're basically looking at the, the father-son paintball team from North Jersey that struck fear into, into people. So we've just been doing stuff for a long time, uh, basically. And, uh, and so, you know, he, he was supportive right from the start. The next morning, I remember we were having breakfast with uh, my brother, and, uh, and he winked at me and, you know, basically saying, you're cool. But later that week, you know, there were a few times when he said, about that whole gay thing, are you still gay? I'd be like, yes. I'm well, because you said basically, so he thought there was some room for. You know. Right, right. Was, yeah. yeah. Um, Brian and Patrick, you are both here um, largely, if not, I mean, largely because of another family member who is not here. Can you tell us a little bit about, about him and how that led you here? Yeah. Um, obviously, anyone who was at this morning's talk already heard uh, a little bit of, of my story, but I'll repeat it uh, as quickly as possible in case anyone in here missed it. But. Um, my late brother, Brennan, was openly gay. Um, he was the student manager at Miami University for the hockey team in Oxford, Ohio. Um, and for our family, you know, we grew up in sports. We grew up in the locker room. Um, and this was something that I wasn't expecting, that our family, I don't think, other than my mom, who says she knew, um, that our family wasn't really expecting. But um, I'll let my dad talk about when Brennan came out to him, but you, you heard the story today of when Brennan came out to me, the first thing I did was make fun of him because that's what older brothers do. And I wanted him to know that nothing in our relationship would ever change, that this just gave me a whole new avenue to make fun of him for things. So <laughs> he would give it right back. You know, if we were walking down the street and we saw some weird straight guy, he'd nudge me and go, your team. And <laughs> the same thing going the other way. So in our house, uh, nothing, Nothing changed. It really was. My little sister, who, Molly, who is two years younger than Brennan, um, when he was telling her, my mother left 
the room and say, okay, this is going to be a big talk and this is going to be important and I should give them a lot of time together. And um, two minutes later, Molly walked out of the room. And my mom was like, did Brennan talk to you? Yeah. Said, and did he say anything? She's like, yeah, he's gay. It's like, and how? And she's like, what? It doesn't matter. So, I mean, obviously you as the father have a, a, another unique perspective on this, but for our family, it was one big shrug. Yeah, I agree. And by the way, they never played us in paintball, so. <laughs> Well, what Patrick said, I mean, um, I, I've worked in hockey all my life. Uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, but I've worked for teams since uh, for 30 years now or something. And uh, I chew tobacco, I ride Harleys, I hunt, I drive a big truck. Probably the last guy that Brendan wanted to talk to about this. And it was just a non event. You know, just to me, it's, it's, I'm gay. I'm like, okay, so what? Like, it just was a. In our family, it was a non-event. And the best part was, as I told Brendan, I didn't have to take anything back. We didn't allow homophobic commentary in our house. We didn't allow racial humor. And I think for a lot of parents that say things like that that are harmful, when they try and rebuild that bridge with that kid, boy or girl, they've got to rebuild a lot more than just saying it's okay. They've got to repair things that they said. And we didn't have to do that. So I said the best part, Brendan, is I don't have to take one thing back I ever said, so he was a great kid. What has the road you've traveled been like? Well, it has certainly been different in its moments. I have much better cocktail party stories than most people do about our, my family. <laughs> um, and people think that it's appropriate to do things like ask me how I was conceived. Like that's an acceptable topic of conversation. So it's been, yeah, it took that one a minute there for y'all, didn't it? So yes, there were ways it was really different, but for the most part, we were a family, and we were an incredibly boring family. I had two moms, we had dinner together every night, and literally a white picket fence. So there were certainly ways that we were different, but in most ways, we were more normal than most of my straight friends' families. Miriam, was that... That 2020 interview, was that really scary to do at the time? No. It was scary for Cynthia because, and I'm sorry she couldn't be here, but she just had too much to do. Um, she was in a teacher at the time, and it, it, you could still be fired uh, in that school district. And also her family was um, still hostile to us. So for her, it was incredibly brave, and I was the one who pushed it. And you pushed it why? Because I felt like it was important to show who we are. I mean, we were new to this. I mean, we were creating all of the, uh, the ways that we parent. We were figuring things out, how to talk to teachers, how to present who we are, uh, what, what what you do when you have the kinds of questions that you get. Um, we were developing the programs, the uh, gay parenting group in San Francisco. We started, we were the first ones who marched in the parade. We started a educators conference to try to, because that was always a big deal in the beginning. What do you do at schools? Because now, you know, with the gaby boom, it's no big deal, but it was a big deal back then. So it was important that we were this, and we, it was incredibly positive. Well, if we can go back to you and Andrew for a second. You um, accepted him right away. Um, for a lot of fathers, it ends there, or that's just, I mean, that's the, that's the end of it. You have since, as I think a lot of people in this room know, become very active in this cause. You've given a lot of money uh, to the fights for marriage equality. You have, and if you could talk a little bit more about this, this would be great. You started a super PAC that gives money to candidates who support same-sex marriage. What made you go from simply accepting your son to wanting to fight this fight for him? I think there's a streak of um, activism in my family uh, trying to make a difference. My father was a um, retail pharmacist, but he was politically active in his uh, neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, I have, uh, alongside my business career, um, been very active in philanthropy, policy, and politics. And so 
as in the beginning of my understanding uh, with Andrew of what was going on, my education, so to speak, um, uh, became aware of the facts regarding uh, 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 sexuality, gender, uh, gay politics, discrimination. What was the um, one thing you learned that most surprised you and most catalyzed you? Surprised me. Um, as, the, as my involvement went on, what surprised me is that intellectually, I knew that this area of trying to make a difference in something that Andrew convinced me, and uh, he didn't beat me over the head, but over a long uh, series of conversations, I became convinced of the, uh, the rightness of what, uh, what he was aiming for. And he was an activist. He was an organizer. He, um, between college and medical school, he spent a lot of time uh, 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 around the country uh, uh, being active. Um, what surprised me uh, uh, in particular was, although intellectually you know that you're affecting the lives or potentially you're attempting to affect the lives of people, it was really only when I got involved in the, um, the Prop 8 uh, project, our first fundraiser for, the, uh, for Prop 8, where um, um, Ken Melman took a very uh, leadership role in that case. A friend of mine, Ted Olson, um, was the one that talked us into um, um, uh, supporting it. But at that fundraiser, uh, I was just, it was just a new level of consciousness and kind of a shock to me to realize how directly um, and how importantly this fight um, was impacting people and that there were so many people in the center or the center right of the political or philosophical spectrum who just were just wanting to uh, be um, to be accepted and to uh, be allowed to be who the, who they were, and that was deeply touching to me and even shocking because I hadn't I hadn't really thought of it that way, in in, in you know changing a regulation or a law or a tax, you know you could feel oh this is great look what we did but uh, here we were really affecting people and they really appreciated it and and it just for some reason intellectually you could say. Well, of course that's what you're doing, but, um, but it, it surprised me, the intensity of that. And Andrew, what has it meant to you to see your dad do these things, and, and have you, have you, has, he, has he allowed you to advise him uh, heavily, frequently? He's, uh, he, he definitely has, and uh, I think we've had a wonderful relationship. And it, just, it hasn't been just the two of us. I mean, you know, my, my husband, Corey, has also been you know, an integral part of the team. Uh, but it's been amazing because, you know, it, it started out being personal support, private support. I mean, you know, when, when other members of, of the family would introduce my boyfriend as my friend, dad would say, no, 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 this is, this is his boyfriend or this is his fiance, this is his husband. And, and that meant a lot to me, deeply. Um, that support ended up being public at a certain point when he got involved in, uh, you know, the different uh, causes of equality, First, we were you know, supporting Glisten, then you know, races, so on and so forth. Um, but you know, the, the event that he was just describing was a really special moment for me because um, at that event, you know, he gave this speech uh, where he talked about you know, deeply personal things, going through our wedding you know, book, seeing the pictures of Corey and I, and his beliefs, his hopes and dreams. And uh, you know, there were a lot of people at that event who were on the right side of the political spectrum. And I remember right after he finished talking, he stepped off the stage, and I went to go meet him, because I you know, wanted to spend time with him, and, and so on and so forth. And this person stepped in my way, and grabbed my hand, and just started pumping it. And he had tears in his eyes. And, uh, and he said, you know, I'm a Republican, I'm a gay person, you know. Um, it was incredible for me to hear what your father just said. You don't know how lucky you are my father rejected me, um, and I just, want, I just want to thank you. I want to thank your father. And, uh, and as I spent the rest of the night basically shadowing my dad, as he went and talked to more and more folks, it was a similar, you know, it was a similar thing that everyone said to him. And it became obvious to me that you know, his support was not just financial. It wasn't just financial gifts for these different issues. You know, for people who had been, many of whom rejected, ostracized, for people who had spent time in a, you know, in a political party that maybe didn't treat them as they thought they should be treated, you know, him standing up and saying, 
I value you, you deserve equality, I love you, essentially. That was, that was deeply therapeutic, I think, for a lot of the people um, who were in that room, who were reading about it, and so that just meant the world to me. Brian, you, you um, if, I, if I have my information, my background, are you correct? Correct. You uh, marched in a gay pride parade in Toronto with your son Brendan before his death. Is that right? Uh, no. And, I, and then I, again, at no, no. It, it's it's ninety percent right. I attended with him, and agreed to march with him the next year. And then his accident came that February. So. And then you and then you marched alone. I have that. marched alone. Uh, I guess uh, two years now. Uh, this year I will not be able to. I don't think. But uh, I've already asked a very well known, uh, famous gay Canadian man to wear the Brendan Burke hockey jersey I wear uh, in my stead. What it, what? Yeah. That, uh, thank you, but I, that's, that's not worthy of any applause, I don't think, but thank now, you. Your advocacy of this in professional hockey, in the world of professional sports, what sort of reactions do you get from some of your peers? What sort of conversations have you had um, where I assume people have said to you, you know, why are you stepping out this aggressively in this way? Well, we solve disputes differently in, in our sport. Um, <laughs> so, so you've beaten a lot of people up. No, I, have, I haven't had to, but I, I haven't been confronted with any negativity because this is the kind of thing that two of our guys might settle in a bar. Like, like even at my age, that's, if someone said something about my son, that would be... That's an acceptable form of dispute resolution in my mind. Uh, so no, I haven't had to deal with much negativity, um, mostly positivity. And the negative people used to enrage me, and now I feel sorry for them. So um, it, it's gone full circle with me in a very short time, because now I feel I've been, I didn't know any gay people before my son. It's that simple. You can work in pro sports and never intersect. Might be coworkers. But I mean, when I say no, my friends are people who come to my house for dinner, people I socialize with, it was zero. And now it's not. And I feel I've been the beneficiary of that from, from the intersection with Brendan's community. So but it's, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not, to me, I'm not interested in converting people who are ignorant. I, I pity them. You know, I, I'll do my best, and then I, I'm not enraged at that point. You know, my, my standard line of them is, it's going to touch you someday. You're going to wish you were more open-minded. It's going to touch you or your family, a coworker, or a friend. It will touch you. And then you will wish you had more, been more tolerant and more accepting. So I feel sorry for those people. I don't, uh, I used to get mad at them. I used to want to kick the shit out of them. <laughs> now it's more, I feel sorry for their ignorance. Patrick, can you talk a little bit about You Can Play and how it came to be and to what extent it's a tribute to Brendan? Yeah, so um, after Brennan's accident, I decided, um, I remember the, the call I had with the guy who runs the gay sports website, and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. Um, and I, I didn't know what it meant. You know, I didn't know how advocacy worked. Um, some of my advisors would tell you that I still don't know that. Um, and I didn't know, you know, how do you do this? What do you do? Who's doing good work? Who should we up with who should we avoid whatever it might be and uh, there were two guys who were running uh, an all-gay all-star hockey team in Denver called G4 Sports and they just went around the country and played hockey games in straight tournaments and gay tournaments with the idea of just showing gay guys can be athletes too and they called and asked me to come out and and moderate a panel for them and it's now for, turned into the uh, the you can play invisible athlete forum where I moderate as an ally and three members of the LGBT athletic community share their story. And we've done them all over the country and all over in Canada at colleges and, and different high schools. And, um, but I wrote a piece memorializing my brother for outsports.com. And it came from wanting to, to write a tribute to him. And there was a line in there that I wrote which was, we need to make it clear that if you can play, you can play. And that came from a scouting meeting that I was in, where we were having a fight over whether or not a player was good enough because he was a little bit short, shorter than we'd like in hockey. And finally, our boss just slammed his cup down on the table and said, look, can he play? And I wrote that line, I just thought, this, this is it. Like, this is what sports should be about. We should go 
on the ice, on the field, on the court, with a level playing field. And all that matters is the work you've put in, the preparation you've put in, and your sexual orientation, your gender identity, your race, your religion, everything about that gets left at the door. Um, so we talked, and the two guys who were running G-Force said, uh, let's, let's do this. So we enlisted, uh, I remember one of our first fundraising meetings, I promised that we'd get, I think every time I turn, the mic loses me. Um, I promised that we'd get 30 NHL players, one from each team. And the meeting seemed a little bit cold, and we walked out, and I said, what? What was that? And they said, uh, they don't think you can get five. So we're up to 60. Um, we had the first ever prof uh, male professional sports team uh, that had two players uh, march in Vancouver Pride uh, with the team van, with the team mascot, and it was an official team event. Uh, you're going to see hockey players in more and more Pride parades starting this summer. Um, Brent Sopel brought the Stanley Cup to the Chicago Pride Parade in 2010 um, in tribute to Brennan. Um, but for me, this was just something that I felt... We had a, a rule in our house, and it was passed down from my dad's grandmother, and we were just talking about it earlier tonight. And our rule was, if you got in a fight at school or on the ice or whatever it might be, uh, you got to ask two questions. And it was, did you start it? And the answer better be no. Because if the answer was yes, you were getting punished. And the second question was, did you finish it? <laughs> and if the answer to that question wasn't yes, you got punished twice. <laughs> so my feeling on this was I'm the older brother. You're supposed to protect your little brother. You're supposed to help your little brother. I don't believe that ends just because he's not here anymore. Um, so I didn't start this, but you bet your ass I'm going to finish it for him. You grew, you've grown up during a period of enormous change. As you were growing up, because you had two moms, because you had your own particular reality, how much of a burden did you feel to educate the people around you, and how much time did you find yourself spending trying to kind of change the world in a way that we end up where we are now? Oh, it's been um, a massive part of my life, um, and I've gotten a little better at it. When I was a small child, I was uh, hostile. I did not grow up in a family where we started or finished fights. Um, <laughs> But I got as close to that line as I could. You don't like it? Why not? What's wrong with it? What's your problem? Um, so I've been advocating for my family my entire life. And fortunately, the questions, while they still exist from everyone, have gotten a little more sophisticated. So there might still be people out there who don't like that I have two moms. But fortunately, I no longer run into people who think it's not technically possible and will try and argue <laughs> with me about it. So it's, it's, it's been a big part of my life, and it's a huge part of my ministry. Marian, when, are we farther along now than you ever thought we would be when you did that 2020 interview, or are we not as far along as you thought? Oh, absolutely, we are. So we couldn't, we couldn't have dreamed it. I mean, from uh, not having Cynthia recognized as a second parent to that falling when Aya was in about the sixth, or seventh grade to being one of the 18,000 people who are married so that um, there's never any problems for us being seen as a family and as parents. So it has totally, uh, totally moved faster than we could have hoped. That's one of the great surprises. I do want to say one thing about Ally, though, because what we have here is the older generation being an ally to the younger generation, and though I, I wouldn't call Aya an ally, and she can speak to why we don't call her that, um, as I have been moving through my life as a lesbian, I came to realize that where I had experienced the greatest amount of discrimination was because I do not um, present as a woman, and, I, and yet I do not, I'm also not a man, that I'm really somewhere on that uh, place on the binary in between. And I was struggling to, to define who I was and what that meant. 
And Aya, who you know has grown up with this and is comfortable with it, and friends, just said to me, "Mom, you're gender queer." And so I was one of the really early persons with this gray hair going, "I'm ginger queer, gender queer. I love it." <laughs> and uh, believe me, there was quite a few in my generation who were, "Does that mean you're not a woman loving woman anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Do you not define that way?" And so, but it just so fits. So she, so. Aya is, has really been there for Cynthia and I as, um, as well, she doesn't like to say ally, but she's been there well, for us. Why would you define yourself? You look like you wanted to jump in and say something <laughs> when she was telling that story. Uh, no, I do like that I gave her her identity there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the audience participation portion of this evening. Raise your hand if you've been an out member of the LG community for more than 30 years. <laughs> Hi. This is my family. This is where I grew up. My aunts and my uncles and my aunts and my uncles um, and all of the LGBT people in our community were my family. I grew up in the era where we still identified people we thought might be gay as a brother or a sister. So this, this is where I live. This is my home, and I can't leave. And for me, I won't be an ally because I've needed an ally. I was a six-year-old kid trying to explain to my teacher that no, I really didn't need to make a Father's Day gift. My grandfather got some lovely woven placemats. <laughs> okay. I was a 14-year-old trying to explain to kids that just because my mom was gay didn't mean I was gay. I've needed allies. I have been a part of this community for a really long time. I like to think of myself as an advocate. I speak for my family. I promote my family. But ally is just a little too removed for me. The predicate of that 2020, of the questions in that 2020 interview, and I think uh, something we all hear often is that when gay is introduced into a family, all of a sudden there's a challenge, there's a difficulty, there's, a, uh, there's something to be overcome. When I look at all of you and I listen to all of you, I get the feeling that quite the opposite, um, gay being introduced into your lives and family has led to rewards and experiences that you might never have had. So this I ask any or all of you, you can, whoever wants to take it, um, how has this changed your life or brought something into it um, that you're extraordinarily grateful for? Well, I, um, you know, this was not something that I ever anticipated. I didn't uh, think that, that Brendan was gay. Um, but this has really been, I think, a great gift to our family. Um, it opened our eyes up to a whole different world of experiences, to a whole different community, to um, just a wonderful group of people that embraced Brendan, that gave Brendan confidence, and I like to think in return he gave members of the LGBT community confidence. Um, we've made some wonderful, wonderful friends um, because of this work. Um, so I think it's been, uh, it's been great for us. We, we never, I never thought this would be my life. I, I never ever thought, like I'm supposed to be at a hockey game. My life before Brennan came out and before his accident was I would watch hockey, I would drink beer, and sometimes I'd go out and chase women. And now I come to things like this, and I get to go to... <laughs> that sounded harsher than I meant it to, I think. Um, Dig your way out of that. Yeah, one. seriously. <laughs> um, but our, our family's really been been touched by, by the LGBT community and, and been really uh, enriched um, intellectually, um, emotionally, um, really on, on any, every level. Uh, I, I'm so grateful that uh, my brother was able to come out and, and be accepted and that we've now been in turn accepted uh, by the community and, and allowed to do some work uh, alongside the LGBT community and on behalf of the LGBT community. Yep. Sure. And for all of you who have children out there, you know my answer to that. I am just so everlastingly grateful that I was 
just able to slide in and get into that alternative fertilization and begin the gaby boom and have this absolutely fabulous daughter who's going to do great things. So that was the answer to the how I was conceived question I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so none of you need to ask. Um, I got this huge family. <laughs> My answer would be um, very similar to um, what's just been said with, um, with the one uh, tweak, everyone in the family accepted uh, Andrew and it brought us uh, together and, and the two of us uh, have been working collegially and energetically to uh, try to uh, influence these, um, these issues. But um, then there was my mother. Um, uh, in 1998, she was 80 years old and she, she um, got on the train with everyone else and very supportive of Andrew. Everyone loves Andrew and the family. And, um, uh, and so um, things went. And uh, she's 95 this month. And uh, I was over uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago for dinner. And at 95, she's having a little bit of trouble with um, uh, cognitive stuff. And I was showing some family pictures and she said, Who's that? I said, well, that's Andrew. And oh, yeah, uh, who's that? Uh, well, that's Corey. Um, who's Corey? That's, that's Andrew's husband. Remember, you were at the wedding? Um, husband, uh, but where's Andrew's girlfriend? Um, and uh, I said, no, no, mom, um, you know you know that he's gay, and uh, Andrew and Corey are married, and they got married, and you, you attended the wedding. She said, yeah, I, I knew he was gay, but I thought he'd get over it. It's funny, as, as people start losing their mind, they tell you what they really think. <laughs> <laughs> we need to wrap Stick this around. up, but is there a beverage coming for someone? Scott? I hope so. <laughs> Not you. Andrew, uh, you looked a little thirsty, so someone sent you a chocolate milkshake. He can explain it to you later at uh, over dessert. One. What? Yeah. We need two straws. <laughs> oh, oh that, yeah. Um, we have uh, one more family um, to introduce. This is a little bit of a surprise. Um, the executive director of this organization, Tim Sweeney, is going to be leaving soon. <laughs> and so his brother, Pat, and his uh, brother, Pat's wife, Teresa, have come from Montana to give a tribute to him. Hello, Tim. Good to see you, brother. Um, we're honored to be here um, and uh, with this distinguished group of families. Um, Teresa and I are thrilled to be here to recognize the remarkable contributions of my brother, Tim, for his 36 years of commitment to LGBT equality, his pioneering leadership for the fight against HIV AIDS, and his lifelong passion for social justice. Tim has never shied away from stepping into leadership, from shouldering responsibility, or from defining a movement's course. Thank you, Tim Gill and the Gill Foundation for inviting us tonight. It's so appropriate that we would pay tribute to my brother as part of a discussion about the importance of family. Family, as much as anything, has defined Tim's life. He's often, he often emphasizes how his family and friends have influenced him and defined him as a person and a leader. But Tim has also changed all our lives. The impact of his work has touched all of us. Our family is stronger because of Tim. Our lives have been enriched because of Tim. I can't think of a better way to pay tribute to Tim than through the words of those who know him best. When the history of our movement is written, uh, Tim Sweeney is going to be right there uh, at the top. Tim has always been one who has 
seen several steps ahead of everyone else. Look at my brother Tim if you want to know what a leader is, right? Uh, because I think Tim exemplifies that. He's so damn smart, so damn charming, you really have to watch out because this is a guy who'll get you to say yes before you know what hits you. Whatever the tough issue of the moment was, Tim was in it. And, and it just really is amazing to me how he stepped in shit and smelled like a rose. Out of seven kids, Tim was number four son. That's one of the ways that we all got identified. Our parents were very strong Catholics. We grew up all as uh, altar boys. Part of that was instilling in us, at the time, you know, sort of a deep Catholic sense of social justice. My father was a bit of a country lawyer, if you will. He showed us a pretty broad spectrum of people that he interacted with and worked with and respected. My mother was a social worker, and she actually worked for the migrant workers. That was like the demonstration of things that you were supposed to do in terms of helping others. Tim is very loyal. You know, 45 years is a loyal friend. He is modest. I think his commitment to equality and social justice is something that is a part of his character. We are a product of our parents, and you can certainly see that in Tim. When he graduated from college, I'd already begun my organizing career. Tim worked for me here on a campaign in Montana in the early 70s, and after that campaign, Tim moved out to California. When Tim moved to San Francisco, he hates it when I say this, but he was working in a hot dog stand at Fisherman's Wharf. He was looking for people to work in community organizations, and he would try to connect people who he thought would make good staff for a particular organization. Tim wound up organizing community jobs. That took off like crazy. This particular issue has a very famous job ad in it for the position in South Chicago that Barack Obama applied for and got, which is pretty amazing. After California, Tim went to Boston and worked for Massachusetts Fair Share and really cut his teeth as a community organizer on housing and other social justice issues. And then Tim moved to New York. Tim and I shared a converted closet space at the ACLU. We were in one office, um, the tiniest of offices. So we really were like daily contact. We went traveling across the country together, speaking at law schools and to community organizations. Tim and Roz came to give a talk at Harvard Law School where I was a student. It was actually the first time I realized that one could do gay rights as a profession. I heard about Tim Sweeney before I met him. He was one of those iconic people, not to mention the fact that he was like one of like three people who had a full-time paid job in the movement. The movement was tiny. By the time I actually came to work at Lambda Legal full-time, Tim was just on his way out and he was moving on to take up leadership at Gay Men's Health Crisis, GMHC. It was truly some of the worst of times in HIV. People were dying, there was no hope, there were no drugs, there were no answers. Um, there were just more and more and more questions. And here was gay men's health crisis trying to set up reasonable policies as well as provide social services. While all of Tim was running all of that, his brother was dying of AIDS. They were inseparable in a lot of ways. Mark was the more theatrical of the two of them. He came out of the closet very early on in his life, and um, but he showed the way, I think, to Tim um, to, to live and be comfortable in his own skin. Tim did an incredible job of caretaking for my brother Mark. At that time, there were really very few drugs, and Tim was his guardian and did all of the work he was living the nightmare personally, and he was living the nightmare professionally. And, and yet he held his head high and every day trudged to work, and every day took care of us. After my brother Mark died in, in 95, my folks went to 
uh, New York for one of the biggest uh, AIDS uh, marches and rallies. I think it was over two million people and they marched in the gay pride parade with Tim at the front of this parade and it was like one of the most important moments I think in my parents' life to understand the connection between the support they had for their sons and the political support they also had for changing the way people thought about AIDS. Shortly after that, Tim repositioned himself to really get into lobby advocacy work, and he went to work for Empire Pride Agenda and was really effective at doing some important state legislative campaign work. I remember very well the night when we were trying, we thought we were almost ready to get the hate crimes bill passed. And I think at that point, Tim had been up about 72 hours straight back and forth with different legislators, with the governor's office, trying to get it over the final hurdle. He called me about 3 a.m. to say that they'd finally worked out a deal and that we were going to get a hate crimes bill. I was just so happy for us, but so proud of him. It's that kind of dogged work that got that first law in New York to say sexual orientation. When Tim had made the decision to move out west, we had our celebratory slash thank you slash farewell slash how can you leave us lunch. It was at that very lunch that Tim and I kind of mapped out what became Freedom to Marry. It was Tim who figured out how we make the bridge to the funding world. I think it was an important time in his life to change careers and that's when he started working in philanthropy. When Tim first started here, he really helped us build a new program area for gay equality. Tim was one of the leaders who pulled together the heads of the national gay equality organizations and other key funders in this area and said, we need a game plan. We need to figure this out. We need to look down the road and have a blueprint for winning. And that was a very powerful moment in the movement. Over the last five years of uh, his leadership at Gill Foundation, he has taken such care to bring the needs of the movement to the board, to align what we're doing as grantors with what would really help people. I think under Tim's leadership, the foundation has honed its mission. It's focused a lot more on some very specific things and gone much deeper. Tim Sweeney embraced Colorado in a way I think we could only dream of. He fosters creativity and innovation in his employees, but also in, in partner organizations. And to have the leader of the Gill Foundation represent us in such an amazing way uh, has been profoundly important and, and, um, and we're extraordinarily thankful. He manages to pull people together and generate a consensus and build a plan for going forward. And that's one of the reasons that we've come so far in the last five years. He should be really proud of his long commitment and what he's accomplished over his tenure. Every movement needs sprinters. We need lots of them to win our issues, but there are sort of few long distance runners. And who really understand what it takes to win and what it takes to build a movement. Um, I feel like you're one of the best long distance runners. Timmy, it's time to come west again, young man. You promised to take six months off. I think we're all gonna hold you to that. I'm uh, thrilled that you're coming back to San Francisco, obviously. You've made a deep dent in so many lives. You've given us all um, a lifetime of rights and a, a lifetime of vision. Thank you for all of your contributions. Thank you for your friendship and good luck. While we're waiting for you to come back in somehow, some way, put the weight of the world down. Love, find love. I can't imagine that we won't see you in the struggle for civil rights. Um, you'll be there in some way and I love you. Tim, you have been a spectacular leader of the foundation. You're thoughtful, you're smart, you're innovative, and you will be incredibly hard for us to replace. Thank you, thank you for working with us.
surprise. So we have promised him that he doesn't have to say anything, which doesn't mean that there is not a microphone here. Um, you know, throughout the course of this conference, people have come and, and thanked me for putting on a great conference. And I, I just want you to know that the way you succeed is you hire people that are intelligent, thoughtful, um, capable. And all of the compliments you have given me belong to the staff. They belong to Tim. Um, and they belong to you. You all have made this conference what it is. You have made it successful. Um, Tim, like I said, will be incredibly hard to replace, and he will be back in the movement in some case. In some way, we will drag him there. Um, I cannot imagine what it would be like to lose his talent and his vision. So thank you, thank you for working for us are deeply grateful. Okay. Damn it. You know, I knew when I saw Bobby Clark's travel receipt that said Billings, Montana, and I, I yelled at Meg and said, I went to Billings. He didn't go to Billings. Who the hell filed this receipt anyways? And then Meg said to me, oh, you weren't supposed to get that receipt. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway. Meg? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thought something was up. Well, listen, I, I, I just have two things to say. The first thing is thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Tim, Scott, uh, Irvishy, John, David, to the amazing staff I've worked with. Uh, I particularly want to do a shout out tonight to Lance and Leah from the donor resources team for putting together these last three days. They're just an amazing, amazing group. Um, you know, to, to my wonderful staff that I work with every single day who inspire me, they work so hard, I love them. Um, to these amazing families, uh, I just want to say, um, keep sharing your narratives. Find six new people that you haven't shared these stories with. Um, just keep the momentum going. I know we're on a roll. It's a great time to be alive, to be in this movement. Uh, I can assure you I'm doing a little, uh, like Jeff called it the other day when I saw him in Albuquerque, self-care. Um, but I'll be back, and I can't wait till we take on the next battle, right? Um, so bless you all. Thank you very much. Pat and, and Teresa, thank you for coming up. I'm sorry we didn't do as good a job of keeping the secret as we perhaps should have. Frank, thank you very much for a spectacular job of moderating. Um, and all of you, thank you. Um, the diversity of stories, the diversity of approaches are things that make our movement strong. And I'm so glad that we have you as friends, allies, participants, advocates. Um, you're the, the people that are going to help us win this. So thank you very much. We have dessert outside. Talk to everyone. Um, come give Tim a hug. You will see him again, but uh, this will be his last kind of large official function with us for the moment. <laughs> Thanks.